Good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is Sebastian Pierus. I'm the director of the Central Asia program at George Washington University. So welcome all to the Central Asia program uh, seminars and welcome to this event on Armenia Azerbaijan relations after the Third Karabakh War. Well, I mean, the South Caucasus is a region that has uh, witnessed uh, significant changes and challenges in recent years, both internally and externally. And the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict, which has been a source of tension and a source of violence between Armenia and Azerbaijan for decades, uh, reached a dramatic end on September, uh, in September 2023, this year when the Azerbaijani military ended the uh, self-proclaimed Nagorno-Karabakh Republic and almost its entire Armenian population fled to Armenia. And this was actually the third war over the disputed territory following the first war uh, in the early 1990s and second war in 2020. And the third war, Karabakh war has had uh, deep consequences for the region and beyond. Uh, Armenia now faces a humanitarian crisis of refugees from Karabakh, while Azerbaijan demands the opening of the Zangezur corridor to connect with its uh, Nahri German exclave to the southwest of Armenia. And Russia, in turn, which is distracted by uh, its war in Ukraine, has lost uh, parts or its leverage over the South Caucasus, leaving Armenia to seek uh, actually new uh, partners in the West. And the West at this moment also uh, concerned about Ukraine as a crisis in the Middle East has shown uh, relatively little interest in South Caucasus. So in this event, uh, we're going to try to explore how this the Third Karabakh War has affected the dynamics and trends of the regional relations, how the regional and international actors and stakeholders have responded to and caught with the challenges and opportunities uh, posed by the war. So uh, I don't want to talk too much because we have a really a big uh, program uh, today with no less that, uh, than six speakers. Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, Mikhail uh, Mamiedov, who proposed this excellent uh, idea to hold this seminar today. So thank you very much, uh, Mikhail, for that. And actually, Mikhail is going to moderate this event. Uh, Mikhail holds a PhD in history for Georgetown University, where he's also a lecturer in history and the liberal studies program of the School of Continuing Studies. His multi-ethnic Azeri-Armenian family arrived in the U.S. back in 1996 in the wake of the outbreak of the Karabakh conflict. Uh, he holds an MA from the George Washington University and diploma in history from Moscow Lomonosov State University. And he has also many uh, papers on history of the Caucasus and on contemporary literature and the Karabakh conflict. So taking into account his huge uh, expertise, Mikhail will be, I guess, more than a moderator. He will probably bring his own uh, expertise. And uh, around uh, this virtual round table today, we have five uh, uh, experts on, uh, on the region and on this conflict. So, First, Nona uh, Sharnazarian, who is an associate researcher at the National Academy of Science in Yerevan and the head of the Center uh, for Independent Social uh, Research Armenia, also in Yerevan. And she has conducted uh, extensive field work in Russia, Armenia, Georgia, the USA, and Nagorno Karabakh. And she has published on the issues of gender, war, migration, memory, and diaspora in the Caucasus and Russia. And she has run the original office of the war of, of the women in war uh, think tank in Yerevan since 2015. Then we have uh, Mr. Ahmed Halili, who is a researcher in international public policy and the regional security of the South Caucasus, the Eastern Partnership countries, and neighboring regional power. Ahmed is part of uh, several peace-building initiatives supported by the EU, UN, and Partnership for Peaceful Consortium. And now he's the director of the Caucasus Policy Analysis Center, which is a Baku-based 
uh, independent think tanks promoting uh, regional integration in the South Caucasus, and is also a lecturer at the Academy of Public Administration on the role of non-state actors uh, in regional security, geopolitics, public management, and good governance. The next uh, speaker is Ms. Arzu Gaibula, who is an Azerbaijani columnist and writer with a special focus on digital authoritarianism and its implication on human rights and press freedom. Arzu has written for Al Jazeera, Eurasian Net Open Democracy, Ready for Europe, with a byline on CNN International. She's also a regional editor for the South Caucasus and Turkey at Global Voices. Uh, and our zoo in the past has been involved uh, in numerous cross-border confidence building projects with the scope of Imagine uh, of the Imagine Center for Conflict Transformation and all the projects focusing on peaceful coexistence between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I would like to add that uh, our zoo was also a visiting scholar with us with the Central Asia program a few years ago, and we're extremely proud of that. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Alexander Iskandarian, who is a prominent expert on politics and nationalism and the contemporary history of Armenia, the South Caucasus and Eurasia. And he's a political scientist and the director of the Caucasus Institute in Yerevan. He has published many uh, works on these topics. He presented papers. He, ha he has talked at many conferences. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Mr. Gerard Toll, who is a political geographer and professor at Virginia Tech's campus in the greater Washington DC area. He's the author of many publications, including a Critical Geopolitics, published in 1996, and the co-author of the Geopolitics Reader. Uh, he has published widely on geopolitics and territorial conflicts after the collapse of Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. Uh, he co-authored Bosnia Remade, Ethnic Cleansing, and its Reversal, which was published in 2011. He wrote Near Abroad, uh, Putin, the West, and the Contest for Ukraine, and the Caucasus, published in 2017. And he has just finished Oceans, uh, Rise, Empire's Fall, Why Geopolitics, Hastens, Climate Catastrophe, which is going to be published in 2024, 20, uh, and all these publications were published by Oxford University Press. So thank you all for being with us today, and I, now I give the floor to, to Mikael. Okay, thank you so much, Sebastian. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I want to start uh, with asking everyone a question. Actually, I want to start uh, I would like to start with Arzu, then I would like to go to uh, Nona, and I would like to go to Alexander, then to Ahmad, and then I would like this question to be answered by Gerard. My question is, well, uh, Sebastian already said a few words what happened. My question would be, uh, why? Whose fault is that? Was it a failure of the Russia? Was it? I'm not. First of all, was it legitimate uh, Azerbaijani uh, desire, this decision to restore its territorial integrity? You know, there are different ideas in international law, uh, right of nations for self-determination and right of each state to preserve its uh, territorial integrity. So was it legitimate uh, Azerbaijani desire to preserve its territorial integrity or was it Russia's fault? fault? to uh, continue its mission of peacekeeping? Was it just uh, Russian thought? Uh, did they really were obsessed with uh, intention? Were well, they intended to sell its oil and gas through the South Stream for Azerbaijan and Turkey? Instead, when they, uh, all this North, North Stream was stopped functioning and they could no longer pump energy resources for, for the center for Ukraine because of this war. And or more, maybe there was a failure of international community, United States and Europe, to pressure Azerbaijan from begin, starting this new war. So in other words, whose fault is that for what happened? I would like to start with Arzu. Why, why it was possible? Because eventually 100,000, 120,000 people left Karabakh. Now we have 
uh, humanitarian crisis in Armenia, when just 120,000 people were left their homelands, they left their houses, uh, homes, and while one of the writers pointed out, I was writing, uh, I, wrote, I published one article, one of the writers noted uh, that nobody could take with him or with her grave, the grave of their parents and grandparents. That is also a great tragedy. So what happened and why, please? I would like to start Thanks, with Thanks, Mikhail. Thanks, yes. Mikhail, for the, for the very loaded question. I think, uh, I mean, to answer it, we may need more than an hour long um, online Zoom conference, but I guess in few words, um, you know, my my view of of the second war and the military operation that took place on September 19th is that, you know, rather than um, trying to understand the the culprits of um, who initiated um, the operation, I think we need to instead really look at the failures of um, all of the stakeholders that you've mentioned in your introductory remarks. And by that, I mean the international stakeholders who were involved in negotiating um, between the two countries since the end of the first war, um, the stakeholders within um, the government of Armenia and Azerbaijan, as well as the role the civil society could have played, um, but was either unable to for various reasons or couldn't simply because whatever grassroots work that took place um, at the end of the first war um, and in the run up to the second war wasn't really well, first of all, welcomed um, in in um, in the countries, but also was really difficult to implement. Um, so I think that's I think my my main sort of argument, uh, my main argument in that. And I think the second point I would like to make is, um, I think we're a little late in the game of of trying to answer this question. I think the question that we should be asking now is, how do we prevent any other escalations and um, how do we work around the current stalemate that we're seeing um, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, this whole confrontation um, of who is going to mediate the peace deal, um, how do we, as broadly speaking, like the, the, the people who are involved in negotiations or the stakeholders who are involved in these negotiations, negotiations how do we make sure that there is more transparency? And how do we make sure that the negotiations actually do take place, the mediation does take place and the peace deal is signed? Because we keep hearing these promises that by the end of this year, there will be a peace deal, but I don't think it's likely um, given, especially given the current circumstances. So I'll leave with that, but that's my, um, that would be my main two uh, points that I would like to make. So to deal with every to deal with everyone's fault, uh, it was the Azerbaijani, Armenians, and Russians, and European and Americans. So all of them contributed to this uh, escal last escalation and the last exodus of Armenians from Karabakh and the last failure. Right. Right. As I as as I said, I mean, I'm not uh, putting blame on anybody because I think, what's the point of now? pointing fingers at stakeholders. It already happened. People already died. Um, there's been a max mass exodus, um, significant suffering of, of, of people. What's the point? Yes, if you we are talking about pointing fingers and actually holding those accountable to account um, in specific uh, legal proceedings, uh, then yes, we can start a discussion based on evidence, based on documents and um, conversations uh, laying that kind of groundwork uh, for for accountability purposes. But um, I think for the purpose of this conversation, I think pointing fingers um, at this point may be a little too late in the game. Okay, thank you. Then I would like to go to Nona, please. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you pretty well. Yes, uh, uh, hello everybody. Uh, it's nice to see you. And uh, I just wanted uh, to, to speak about a couple of points that makes people very, uh, very, very unhappy here. Uh, just to say that on September 28th, 2023, the head of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, Sandel Shahramanyan, issued a decree um, signing the termination of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic's existence effective January 1, 2024. So um, before that, as you may know, uh, there was this... Um, First of all, this Second Karabakh War, so-called Second Karabakh War, and the 19th September military offensive, which um, Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev, actually using the vocabulary of um, um, Vladimir Putin, calls uh, counter-terroristic operation, uh, uh, and. Um, uh, before that, uh, there was a, a blockade, uh, which um, which was uh, terribly painful for population and maximally de uh, de uh, denied by Azerbaijani NGOs and government. So 130,000 people left um, their, um, their homes. And this is kind of historically this is unprecedented uh, case and it never happened before uh, and uh, I, I myself was absolutely surprised uh, to um, uh, to see how 1030 uh, 100, people uh, left their homes in three days um, but this the problem is uh, that um, right now this I don't know even how to call them IDPs or um, refugees or to create another concept because um, naming is uh, and concepts are very important. Still, um, these people, especially I can see generational gap and generational differences, they all are kind of longing to go back. And the problem to me from the very beginning, the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, kind of existed in uh, ambiguous, um, in a ambiguous legal uh, framework. First of all, the, there were these um, huge problem of contradiction in in framework of the legal uh, uh, international law. Uh, this is contradiction between self-determination principle and territorial integrity. Uh, and, um, uh, and more than that, right now, uh, we can see that uh, Ilham Aliyev uh, is still on his maximalistic moods. And he actually um, somehow uh, the problem is that um, these two countries and even more, Russia, Turkey uh, and other stakeholders, big powers, they see the uh, peace um, the peace agreement, which is kind of, it looks like it's inside, but still we can see that uh, each part see the peace agreement in their own way. And uh, the most important to me that um, um, Azerbaijan uh, insists uh, that Russia would be a third part of negotiations. And, and here, um, I think um, it is kind of, um, to me, it is also very, visible proof that uh, actually Russia uh, never was on on side of Armenia and on ev each on every every possible uh, platform academic or NGO platform 
and internationally, Azerbaijani uh, scholars would say that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Armenians, they won the First Karabakh War because Russia was on their side. And right now we see that uh, Erdogan um, and um, Aliyev, Ilham Aliyev and Putin, Vladimir Putin, they act as, um, I don't know, twin brothers. Uh, and uh, we can see, and actually I did that work, I, I tried to analyze the content of speeches of Putin, uh, Aliyev and Erdogan, and we can see that they act uh, um, almost synchronically, almost, uh, you know, almost... Um, Identically. Yeah, and identically, exactly. Thank you very much. So um, another problem is that uh, Armenia cannot uh, go into this um, uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan mediated by Russia peace treatment because Armenia, Armenian security, uh, security situation is very fragile still. Uh, and uh, uh, Armenia needs um, really trustful guarantors, and Russia Internet. cannot be guarantors and a guarantor of uh, security anymore. Uh, plus, this uh, CSTO um, CSTO problem and membership of Armenia in this CSTO uh, is a, a, a huge discourse here and uh, I think um, yes, internationally yes, yes. maybe uh, so um, um, the thing oh, is you know, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt you but uh, you need to give uh, other members a chance to speak yeah let absolutely me ask let me just question. conclude uh, yeah. by saying that uh, uh, let me just conclude by saying that Armenia is not uh, uh, doing a direct claims about going out of uh, CSTO uh, and um, but still um, trade war from Russian side we are witnessing it right now and yeah to be continued thank you very much for your attention okay thank you I have a couple of questions first of all uh, do you think that is there is any chance of Armenians coming returning to Karabakh do you think it is possible um, yeah, Mikhail, thank you very much. This question is actually enormously, uh, you know, torturing uh, people here. I mean, uh, Arabari people here, uh, um, uh, just because I would characterize them as extreme, uh, as very rooted people. And uh, this is all about their, let's say, homeland. And um, May, most of them now they have this reminiscent of a great life with Azerbaijanis back in Soviet Union. Still, um, soberly speaking, they understand that without third, um, without third uh, power, let's say, or mediation mediators or peacekeepers, uh, they they actually they don't feel secure to go back there. So they need some guarantees, but they are longing to go back. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, I would like to go to Ahmad. Can you please tell us uh, what do you think, what, what happened on September 19, uh, September 20, uh, 23rd, please. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and this opportunity to speak, hey, Mikhail. Thank and you. frankly speaking, your the question, I believe that why it was possible, uh, the determinants that led to the 2020 Karabakh War and uh, 2023 September events, they are basically the same. I would say that there is a not big change taking place. So it's like that the same uh, issue, but in both cases. In both cases, uh, I would say that there is a uh, one important thing that unites two cases, and it's increased expectations. So Azerbaijan, I believe the officials, Azerbaijan officials, they were hiding the intention that the goal is to restore the sovereignty on full uh, territory, and 
there was assumption that 2020 Karabakh war resolved all the issues, but then apparently there was a, um, a, a misreading of the three-party statement, and the result of that there was a uh, that led to the 2020 uh, street war. But increased expectations, I believe that in this case plays a very important role. In 2019, there were quite a positive wave of developments when parties were promised that it is going to be uh, like the peace is very close and it's going to be very easy to reach the peace within a few uh, months. And in March, there was a meeting in Vienna and also there was an elevated diplomacy between President Aliyev and the Prime and Minister Pashinyan if you remember those days. And uh, also there was exchange okay. of the visitors, uh, uh, like some journalists from Armenia went to Azerbaijan and some Azerbaijan journalists went to Armenia. So there were a lot of increased expectation back then. And when those expectations were not fulfilled, that led to a certain emotional surge and that, that led to the war. And uh, among many, many other reasons. Uh, this time also, frankly speaking, I would say that there was a quite a positive development taking place especially with the Prime Minister Pashinyan declaring that Karabakh is Azerbaijan. So, and the, basically, we are, we were hearing it from everyone. Uh, you mean Pashinyan declared Karabakh a part of Armenia, you mean? No, Azerbaijan, like I'm talking about 2023. Ah, like yes, the, yes, 2020, yes, yes. So uh, that was the first, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, like, to show that there the are similarities between two cases. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, when, yeah. when, Yes, and the when officials from both from Armenia and Azerbaijan they constantly clear that, that they are super close to signing the peace deal, and and suddenly you had this crisis, uh, like the I, I would say that there was a the, the crisis in the platforms, and the problem that could not solve the problem right now, and suddenly the by the summer of twenty twenty three like the peace wasn't that close. So because in April also, actually in May, uh, U.S. Uh, mediation process started. It was quite like the, let's say, there was a quite positive developments, then European platform catch up. So May, June, there was a quite major developments. But in July, starting from July, we would see that there are certain developments that uh, didn't fit to the this positive picture. And also when the highest point of this and the highest point of disappointment for Azerbaijan was the United Nations Security Council resolution in August. Uh, it was a very stressful moment for the uh, for the Azerbaijan um, um, society that how come the process ended up there, like that we would have a very beautiful process. So that increased expectation that not fulfilling those expectations, suddenly they create a certain momentum and that... Uh, um, uh, you know, changed into the something devastating, um, uh, some military operations. So that is why, um, again, Azerbaijan, uh, it was not secret, Azerbaijan wasn't hiding that, it intends to restore its sovereignty on the full uh, territory of the Karabakh. And for Baku, again, the 2020 Karabakh were supposed to solve all the problems, but then when the, uh, the messages from Armenian side was that everything stays as the same, but in a much smaller scale, and then this increased expectations. So I believe that that led so it was possible. And but there is a one crucial difference uh, from 2023 and the 2020 um, uh, um, uh, war, and that is, I would say that 2023 took place with the much less contact between Baku and Ankara. It was very important change, and in this context, I believe that. Uh, the events in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine that enabled Baku to be um, less dependent on contact with Turkey. So that's all that I can say. Okay, thank you. My question also to you would be, do you think that Armenians might can return, it would be possible for them, uh, for them to return to Karabakh? Or yes, absolutely. Uh, no, but for me, the question is that to like the, how many of them are going to come back? So that's the question for me. Uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis are living without any peacekeeping forces in between them in Georgia and in Istanbul also. In Istanbul, <laughs> Turkey. But there are Georgian police, Georgian troops. 
Uh, well, still, no, there, there, there are the villages that with that, and also in Turkey, in the in Istanbul, I, I have seen them, them in quite in a good cooperation. So that these kind and of Russia. cases, sorry, and in Russia, yes, that one also. Yeah. But you know, uh, uh, no, I'm, 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 you know, I, I try to talk about the cases that is, uh, yeah. I would say that more that some some kind of home ground right so not uh, the, the, the a bit like that like diaspora i'm like that, that yeah. yeah so uh, uh, so yeah so so that is why i believe it's possible uh it's very i would say that i wouldn't i don't want to call it a normal but you know if you are locked in the one place for nine months it's so natural that you want to get out and the, the pandemics that was a perfect example like the, when people locked up in in baku uh, the, the right when the um uh, certain restriction canceled <laughs> there was no one uh, left in baku but imagine these people in a war zone so that is why i believe that for them um and uh, just the getting out it was so natural and also earthquakes when it's uh you know in the baku people are very um experienced in earthquakes when earthquakes something devastation happens people immediately leave their homes they wait for aftershocks they wait a bit with the all the neighbors they gather in the you know you know somewhere they wait for the aftershocks then then check that if there is a gas leak or not if it's safe to come back so then they go back to their homes so i believe that that's going what's going to happen to the carbohydrate means so, so but the number of them how um, many of them are doing, going to come back uh, this is the this is a big question, but uh, I'm I'm not going to speculate on that. Frankly speaking, I I can say the certain figures, but uh, there might be very very. Uh, but do you think that there um, would need some at least international guarantee, international forces, and not Russian, maybe French, maybe I don't know, Japanese, I don't know, Iranian, whatever. Uh, let me tell you this one. Like the, I'm 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 again like the when uh, Karabakh Armenians were living. Uh, uh, Karabakh, um, Azerbaijan government sent a lot of journalists just to document that, you know, just asking them questions. And I, I believe that I, I, I told it in one of the interviews also, like those documenting those uh, questions, they had a one big positive side effect that for the three days, ordinary Azerbaijanis, Azerbaijani public, they constantly they were exposed to the interviews of Karabakh Armenians. They saw the yeah. real Karabakh Armenians, who they are. And I would say that there were quite many interesting uh, moments. Uh, frankly, my um, um, Karabakh Azerbaijan friends, like I would say that there was a quite many moments that the feeling of empathy was stronger among the Karabakh Azerbaijanis because they had a very similar situation. And uh, suddenly the closeness of the mentality the lifestyle the, most of them the interviewed people could speak in a quite good Azerbaijani uh you know that created a certain uh that sent a quite a lot of positive messages to Azerbaijan audience again like that was a side effect and I but frankly speaking I don't know any uh peace project peace building project that could do that much in that short time than uh, the side effect of the journalists asking Karabakh Armenians those questions. So that is why uh, that started certain discussions within Azerbaijani uh, uh, society. Also, like the, that, that showed that well, this is the this is a, these are the people much closer mentally in the, in, in the context of the lifestyle to Azerbaijanis. Where is that process is going to lead? Um, well, that's also open question, but I believe that that certainly creates certain closeness. Uh, and, but you know that Genesis uh, that... was not this. Sorry? Genesis, this uh, football star, he would not know who he is, uh, was not able to enter Azerbaijan. His club said that he's not going. Who? So, so sorry, I missed the name. So sorry. Genesis, player. for whom he's playing, for Inter or for, uh, I forgot who, where he's playing now. Is it Inter or I don't know. It's a star on the I, level 
Maybe. So, so I sorry. Like so, I, I'm not a big football or soccer fan. So sorry. I'm, so that's why I, I'm not <laughs> exposed to that case. But I, I can tell you like the, this but, one, but like he, the whatever. He, he, he plays very good. Well, he's not made of good, but not uh, not Maradona, but he's a great player. Okay, no, never mind. Uh, okay, I would like to say I would like to give word to Alexander, please. Alexander, please. Can you hear us? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I would try to, to answer your questions uh, short. Paradoxically, but it is not, usually it's not very easy to, to, to answer short. Here, I think everything is more or less clear. First, I wouldn't call what happened in, um, in NK this September uh, war. It was not war. Uh, Karabakh, Armenian army was not there. Karabakh was uh, surrounded for last years, and it was blockade there. And Nagorno Karabakh, uh, non recognized Republic of Nagorno Karabakh's uh, army, was not able to, to, to demand. It was ethnic cleansing, it was just deportation of population from Nagorno Karabakh. Then, oh, why uh, did they uh, do it? Because they can. Because they could. It was a goal of Azerbaijan from the beginning. In the uh, uh, Second Karabakh War, they were stopped uh, at the, how they call it, last call. Uh, Russians came there in the last moment, uh, Russian peacekeepers, I mean, and uh, by some reasons it was not, not possible for Azerbaijani army to finish what they did. It, actually, what happened in September 23 was was, was final act what, uh, uh, of the war of 2020. Uh, so it was a goal, Karabakh, as fully part, not even an autonomy, Karabakh, just as uh, as a land, not as people. Azerbaijanis did not need Karabakhians, and they needed territory. And it became uh, part of uh, Azerbaijan de facto uh, as well. Uh, and why they, why, why it was like that? Because of several reasons, but the main one was Ukrainian war. Uh, guys was busy, and they are busy till the moment. I mean, Russians. Uh, Azerbaijan is quite, quite important for uh, Russians till the moment, even now, because of oil, because of gas, because of uh, relationships with Turkey. Turkey is extremely important uh, for Russians generally and in, in context of Ukrainian war. And nobody in Russia was going to open second front in the south uh, after Ukraine to help uh, 100 or 150 uh, Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh for what? So that was the re reason why they could do it. I never was so optimistic as Ahmad was in uh, 2019. Uh, because it was, Azerbaijan was preparing to war approximately seriously from 2004-2005. Uh, Azerbaijani budget was, uh, military budget was bigger and bigger all that time. And institutional, uh, institutionally they work with Turks of uh, preparing Azerbaijani army for that and, and weapon from Turkey and Israel and ideology and everything. It, it was not just in 2019. You cannot uh, organize such kind of war in one year or two years or three years. They were preparing for that, for that and the moment was uh, moment was brilliant for Azerbaijan in 2020 and especially after uh, after the beginning of Russian-Ukrainian war and changing of situation with foreign, um, not foreign, but 
outside, not Caucasus actors in the region, I mean, Turkey and Russia, they could do what they did want. That's it. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you something else. Actually, two questions. Well, was it uh, rational for Armenians to have in Karabakh when Pashinyan declared agreed that Karabakh is a part of uh, Azerbaijan? Was it rational to have presidential elections in Karabakh to elect what was his name, Shahramanian, uh, to elect the president of Karabakh? Wasn't it playing with fire at that moment? It depends what you what you call rationality. After 2020, in general, Armenian politics, Armenian, I mean both uh, recognized Republic of Armenia and, and non-recognized Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, or Artsakh, as Armenians call it, uh, it, it was chaotic because of situation. It was a pressure. Uh, really, you didn't have, uh, as Nona said, guarantors or guarantees for security, for physical security, people living there. And the chair of uh, President of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic was not the best chair in the world. And the problems connected with management there, without possibilities for that management, with all, all this blockade, etc., was not very easy. So it was a part of chaotic politics when people tried to somehow to, to stabilize situation, which I don't think, didn't think that time, I don't think that it was possible in principle, because uh, after the beginning of uh, Ukrainian war. If Ukrainian war would not begin in 22, September 2023 would not exist. Most probable, because uh, the, the Russians' mood from beginning was to have Nagorno-Karabakh as an instrument, as a tool to impact both on Armenians and on Azerbaijanis. And it yeah. was an, an instrument for that. After the beginning of, uh, of the war, of Ukrainian war, it, uh, after aggression, it, it was not functional already. Situation changed. It changed around and immediately or, or with a lack of, I don't know, several yeah, months. And I, want to ask, yeah. and I wanted to ask one question specific, uh, specifically to you. You were in Abkhazia recently, yes? And we talked about it. Uh, was there any concern in Abkhazia that Karabakh scenario might happen over there too? If Russians left Karabakh, well, basically that. I don't know why these peacekeepers are still saying that. Perhaps uh, Inham is still writing his New Year, uh, New Year speech to the nation because he's waiting for uh, December, mid of December, to ask uh, peacekeepers to leave to say to tell nation that not only Karabakh was taken, but there is no more foreign troops, foreign boots on the ground. But was there is any is there is any concern in Abkhazia about that what happened in Karabakh might happen there too? You were in Abkhazia recently, right? Uh, it's not about concerns. Sure, you have different type of discourses and different type of people, both in Georgia and Abkhazia, and talk, talking about <coughs> sorry uh, about this uh, question or problem. But I don't think that it is. Uh, possible to imagine now in this political reality that Russian troops, Russian uh, army will will uh, will leave, we will go out from Abkhazia. You don't have peacekeepers there. You have military bases. You have not, it, it's a vice versa process. Now now they are open. They are going to open a port in Ochamchiri in southern. Uh, Abkhazia, etc. So I don't think that it is possible scenario. Absent theoretically, if Russians will leave somewhere in future, they would leave Abkhazia or South Ossetia. We can speculate on that, but politically, in political perspective, I don't see such kind of uh, such kind of possibility. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Now, I want to, we, we should go to, we should start picking up questions uh, from the floor uh, very shortly. But now I want to ask something else. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, Zangezur Corridor. Uh, everyone uh, in the same order. What is Zangezur Corridor? Was it, uh, my impression was that uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan guaranteed uh, to, to guarantee that Armenians would be able to move goods, move everything through, through the mainland Armenia to Karabakh without any problems, and Armenia in return would, may, would, would there would be no obstacles for the bringing goods or anything uh, from uh, territory of Azerbaijan to Nehichivan, uh, from the territory of Armenia. And now Azerbaijan still insists on this Zangezur corridor. Moreover, they say that it should be ex-territorial uh, road or whatever. Uh, I would like to go for the same order. I would hey, like to start. I am. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm very sorry. I forgot about you. I'm very sorry. <laughs> yes, please. Well, I, can I can, uh, why don't I take that question and, you know, just make what a few... Had for I'm very sorry, I apologize. That's okay. I, I can build on what Alexander said, which is um, that... Why it happened when it happened. You know, you can see what happened in 2023 as a manifestation, and lots of have written on this, as a manifestation of a Russian weakness in the South Caucasus. And that is a consequence of the Ukraine war, the Ukraine war not going to plan, because, of course, the Ukraine war is supposed to be a, a very, very short, a quick, victorious, glorious war for, for Russia. Um, and, and I think that the idea that Karabakh was this territorial lever in the South Caucasus, which enabled um, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan to be mediated by Russia as a sort of uh, uh, outside broker, uh, that that has gone. But the Zangazur, so-called Zangazur corridor, this particular vision of an, an area uh, through Sunik province in southern Armenia is potentially a new territorial lever. And what is uh, scary, about the current situation, and this gets to your question, what happened, is that in effect, in, uh, in, on the 19th of September, um, Azerbaijan chose war. It chose the military a particular option, the military track that it had been building up for years, but it lied, its officials, diplomats lied to uh, American officials and European officials, strung them along. Uh, and so there's quite a bit of, um, backlash against that. Jim O'Brien testified before the House of Representatives uh, on the 15th of November about this, that we don't have relations, you know, things are not back to, will not be normal with uh, Azerbaijan because of this. So there's a sense of betrayal about that. Now, what's scary about it is that potentially there can be further territorial encroachments. There's already uh, claims by uh, Armenia that um, Azerbaijan occupies internationally recognized Armenian territory uh, in the south. And so that is concerning because potentially there could be continued violence and then maybe Russia comes in as a peacekeeper, but you have a new territorial lever, but at the expense of Armenia. Uh, and so I think that's one major concern. Uh, what happened, the actual details of that, the State Department is doing a kind of full action review of all of that. Uh, what clearly happened in terms of the population in Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, myself, my colleagues have done research there, uh, and there was no trust uh, if, uh, over um, uh, Azerbaijan taking over uh, the territory. And, you know, frankly, that was a perfectly rational position to have, which is the the hate rhetoric that had been generated for years against uh, Armenians uh, was something that was falling upon them. 
Uh, and therefore, when, in effect, they began this military push, uh, you saw what was this you know, massive force displacement, uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, and, you know, this is, was a horrible spectacle. Uh, and that, I think, has meant that Azerbaijan has tilted further towards the, the kind of axis of authoritarians that are um, going against the rules-based international order. Now, there's lots of problems with the rules-based international order, but uh, one of the kind of structural causes of what has happened was this axis of authoritarian leaders. Uh, and I think Nona uh, brought that up, with, you know, making a very, very good point about the kind of affinities uh, between these different leaders in Turkey, Azerbaijan, and in, uh, and in Russia. And in that sense, Armenia is different. And Armenia... Uh, is something that is worth supporting on the part of uh, of the West because of the fact that it is a democracy and because of the fact that it is a, it is currently in a very vulnerable position. Now, do you think Armenia would be supported by the West? Uh, like Ursula von der Leyen, she visited Azerbaijan. I think it was uh, to warn you after this uh, uh, I think it was, uh, no, it was before September war, but it was after 2020, uh, after the 2020 war, after the war 2020, and she called Ali a reliable and trustworthy partner. It was made, but many Armenians, many in Armenia were very, very upset about that. Her visit, uh, her taking pictures with Ali. And do you think that, uh, because, you know, when Russians stopped, uh, when Russia was, when there was embargo on Russian oil and gas, uh, many in the West were started looking for other sources of uh, energy resources. And isn't it Azerbaijan becoming one of these alternatives for Russia, for Russian oil I, I, and gas? That's that's that is what happened. That's one of the consequences. I think it's an unfortunate. Uh, um, decision on the part of uh, the European uh, Commission president to go to to Baku and uh, and to to do that in that way. Uh, but you know, at that time, there was the possibility that the non-military track would have been one that was, uh, um, it, you know, frankly, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, that was a rational thing to do. They should have continued to pursue the diplomatic track in order to build up their uh, bona fides in the international community. That, that's all gone now. Uh, and, you know, the, as a consequence of that, uh, they are, um, a, you know, in a certain diplomatic isolation. But of course, how long that lasts is, is, is uh, an open question. And you're right to point to the fact that uh, uh, hydrocarbons corrupt uh, uh, even you know the not simply the regimes and encourage the sort of petro authoritarianism but also those that are dependent upon them and one of those dependencies is the de continued dependency of the European Union uh, for natural gas okay thank you and can you please comment on the last my last question uh, when you started talking about it about the Zangizur. Uh, what do you think about the Zangizur uh, corridor? Was it somehow, wasn't it guarantee, like something that Armenia was supposed to guarantee to Azerbaijan instead of the free passage to Karabakh? And when this Karabakh basically stopped to exist, well, how does it make any sense to provide? Oh, yeah, to there was this the symmetry of corridors, right? Uh, at least that's what... Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yes. That's a very good formulation. That's a very good way. The symmetry of, yes, uh, the similarity, this is a reply was the same. We, we will provide you with uh, free passage for Armenia, and you provide us with the same, uh, with the same right through the territory of Azerbaijan. Yeah, well, I think the, the U.S. position on this is is a good one, which is the no corridor if it uh, has in any way is in any way brought about by coercion and violence, uh, that there has to be legitimacy to this particular corridor. And that has to be negotiated between the parties. Uh, there's lots of good reasons for it. Uh, and uh, all parties are uh, in can see the rationale, the economic rationale for it, even though uh, 
you know, as someone who is very concerned about climate change, I don't think that there's a rationale for continued pipelines and the like. I think we need to be getting off fossil fuels. But there, there is the possibility for a win-win here. But Azerbaijan, by its actions, has set things back. Uh, and it had an opportunity to show itself in a different way, show a different face to the international community uh, than the one that it chose to show uh, on the 19th of September. Okay, thank you. And now we're going with the same question to Arzu. What do you think about this corridor? Corridor in exchange of uh, corridor exchange of Armenian exchange. It was, uh, in my opinion, that's how I read it. That's how I felt. The corridor for Armenia was an exchange of free passage for Lachin. Zangizor corridor was, it? I believe that was a, that's how I imagined. That's how I read it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mikhail. I mean, there, before before I even get to that question, um, there are a couple of things I wanted to um, piggyback on both, uh, especially after hearing what uh, I'm sure Art said, because a lot of the things that he, a lot of the points that he raised made a lot of um, sense in, in, in the given context. First of all, I think the, the way where we are um, in relation to Karabakh, where we are in relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan is very much the failure of diplomacy in the first place, right? The fact that the uh, Second Karabakh War even took place, that's also a failure of democracy. The fact that September 19th happened, that's even uh, worse of an epic failure um, of making progress, which then takes me back to what um, uh, the points that um, Ahmad was making earlier in, in his remarks about all these um, positive developments that have taken place since the 2020 war um, until uh, September 19. I, I mean, I would really question the genuine um, presence um, and the genuine approach uh, to those meetings that were taking place. Yes, uh, they were meeting across different European capitals. Yes, they were meeting on the sidelines of various international events, but to what end there was actual genuine interest, especially um, among the officials representing Azerbaijani government present in these meetings to actually uh, reach some kind of um, long-term uh, positive outcome in these negotiations. So I wanted to raise that question. Um, and also one other thing I wanted to say about the blockade um, that kept uh, people locked up for nine months. You know, the reason why people were fleeing after September 19th wasn't because they were locked up just on their own will for the nine months. They were locked up there for a reason. And they were locked up intentionally. First, as this image of environmental protest, which then became very clear that this was not an environmental protest, that this was an intention far along. Um, so I would... Yeah, I wanted to clarify um, those um, those those points before I, I I moved forward. And to your question, you know, this this um, symmetry of corridors, this for or that. I mean, honestly, even having this conversation around corridors uh, makes little sense to me at the point where we're not even recognizing um, the the humanitarian cost when we're not recognizing what. Um, the uh, September 19 incursion caused and resulted in. Um, and then at some point, our officials even said that Zengiz reporter was not even important anymore, that they were negotiating with Iran and that they were having their own new routes. Um, and then uh, yeah. Prime Minister... Right. Iran, of course. There is a road through I'm Iran. There is a road through yes. Iran. Yes. Yeah, and, and Hikmet Haji have said in October in an interview with Reuters that um, Azerbaijan had no plans to see Zengazur and that uh, the country was working with Iran instead. Um, so bringing this into uh, the conversation, again, I think we need to, you know, be 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 conscious and, and understand that, yeah. you know, having a conversation around Zengazur corridor and leaving everything aside and not really pushing for the legitimacy, the transparency, the accountability, it kind of leaves this whole conversation around peace process again in um, in a place that um, doesn't yeah. leave us 
with any promising future. So that's my that's my take on on, on the corridor. Let's go to uh, let's go to Nona because you know we really are, are running out of time. We have to start picking up questions from the floor. Yes, Nona, please. Yes, yeah, please. thank you. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I just think that Toal was absolutely right that um, to say that um, Armenia actually uh, is. Uh, not only just democratic because of this velvet revolution back in 2018, but also uh, Niko Pashinyan uh, said the phrase that Armenia, Armenia's security system is democracy. But at the same time, yeah, it's, all, it's, it's, it's all is happening in the context of uh, 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 Armenia losing its political subjectivity because of the pressure by Russia. So I think Zangizur Corridor is a very, very um, um, odd, uh, strange topic uh, because of the regime that uh, uh, is going to be uh, obsessively to be imposed on Armenia because it should be extraterritorial uh, uh, extraterritorial road controlled by Russia and, you know, in the context of this uh, terrible uh, question of en enclaves and borders itself between Armenia and Azerbaijan, demarcation and delimitation and this um, terribly contradictive yeah. claims of Azerbaijan about being successor of um, IDR uh, and uh, not Soviet Union, but still uh, making point that the, I don't know, the uh, borders of uh, that Soviet period would be good. So in, in that situation, Pashinyan's government actually calls this uh, opening, um, opening uh, roads for trade uh, with uh, all re regional actors. He calls it... Yeah. Um, Peace crossroads, which means that he is uh, uh, the Pashinyan government is very positive about opening Armenia, uh, especially because all yeah, these thirty yeah, years, yeah, all transport tra transport roads were uh, uh, were constructed in a way to avoid Armenia and to marginalize Armenia, but still with corridor, uh, you know the the importance of this corridor. Uh, would be to say that Iran opened an, a consulate uh, last year in Kapan, uh, the administrative exactly. center of the Sunnic region in southern Armenia. Plus, Russia has now announced that it intends to follow suit. And local sources said the Americans and French are also considering setting up consular uh, posts in Kapan. So if that were to happen, four major powers would have a diplomatic presence in a relatively remote small town in, uh, in southern Armenia, with a population of just if, uh, over 40,000 people on, uh, on the yeah. one hand. And on the other hand, uh, all well, of this shows, uh, how, shows how important this part of the South Caucasus became. Okay, thank you. And now I have to go, you know, because we need to start picking up questions from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the room. Yes, and Ahmad, please just keep it short. Okay, yeah, so many issues to react. Frankly speaking, there was all like I was listening to the, um, uh, the, my colleagues, and that there, there are quite many issues that I would love to react, but I'm going to keep it very short. Uh, the question about the Zengizer corridor. I don't think that there is a Zengizer corridor issue anymore, especially with the uh, Prime Minister Pashin announcing that uh, peace corridor issue. So, by the way, that project was, it, it caused a great deal of irony in Azerbaijan because the moment Azerbaijan announced that it doesn't need the Zengizer corridor anymore, after two days, Prime Minister Pashinyan flew to Tbilisi and announced that it should have basically the same project with a different name. But the moment that Azerbaijan announced it doesn't need that corridor, it was announced. So there is a non-Zengizer corridor issue, but there is a, a FSB, a troops issue. Who is going to provide the security? So from Armenian perspective, 
Armenia is the, the as a like the recognition of each other is territorial integrity and sovereignty. Azerbaijan should say that it there should be no FSB forces there. Uh, that's the quite big important issue right now that creates tension between Baku and Yerevan. But the issue is that right now Armenia tries to uh, trade with something that it doesn't know. Uh, Armenia has no, it, its sovereignty over its southern borders is under question because since 1992, it's controlled by Russian troops. Armenian mm -hmm. Turkish borders and Armenian Iranian borders are the Russian FSB forces are already there. So now Azer uh, Armenia demands that Azerbaijan should say that I don't need FSB troops there. So it means that basically the meaning of this step is that Russia should leave the southern borders, the borders between Iran, the uh, Iran and Armenia, the former Soviet uh, Iran border, right? The Russians didn't leave that territory. So, and if Azerbaijan says that, it means that Baku is going to face Russia directly. So it's going to be a very challenging moment for Baku. And it means that if Baku says that, well, I agree that there should be no FSB forces, uh, Yerevan could easily take this issue, take it to Moscow and they say that, look, Azerbaijan doesn't want you there also, so get out. So it means that Azerbaijan should win Armenian sovereignty over Armenia's southern borders with Iran. So that is why there is a North Zangezer corridor issue anymore. The both parties that accepted that this is as a railway link, as a regional logistics, both parties basically, I believe that Azerbaijan after some time might come back to this idea. Uh, so they need these transport infrastructure. So there is no issue. The issue about the FSB troops, who is going to provide that? And the problem is that Russian FSB troops, the border troops, they already are there. And Azerbaijan yeah. going against that is going to put Azerbaijan in direct confrontation with Russia. And frankly speaking, Baku doesn't want to do have that. So uh, that's the one issue. They also elaborate the war in Ukraine that enabled Azerbaijan to do that. Uh, frankly speaking, no. Uh, the thing is, Azerbaijan, again, it, it, like for Azerbaijan, the, everything was finalized by 2020 Karabakh War. Everything's supposed to be clear. Uh, war in Ukraine enabled Azerbaijan to act with the less intensive contact with Turkey. So the, 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 the initial plan was to balance Russia in the region with a joint uh, Azerbaijan-Turkish let's say action. But the war in Ukraine made sure that Baku acts on its own on, on, on many issues. And I believe that yeah. that is the result of this. So will, if there is no war in Ukraine, will those events happen? Yes, with less intensity, with more time, but that they, they will take place. Uh, about lie okay. that sh sh you yeah. uh, you want to comment on the lie issue also because for the last one month and a half I've been three times to Brussels, oh, oh, that, Vienna, uh, and Spanish. Vilnius. And sorry, we need to go with Alexander. So you think that there is no real issue of Zangezer at this moment? I believe that Armenia and Azerbaijan both yeah. want that because yeah. uh, that, that transport link is very important. But the issue about the FSB troops there, that is the issue right now. So I, I can so is, comment on this, but I'm going to stop there. Okay, I'm sorry, because I have a lot of questions on the on my screen. Yes, Alexander, can you please comment on the issue of Zangizor? Alexander, can you hear us? Alexander, uh, hello. It's muted. Is he muted? Yeah. My God. Okay. My God. Oh, now I can. Uh, by yeah, some please. reason, I couldn't uh, unmute uh, myself. Uh, as for Zangezur, so-called Zangezur corridor, first I would agree with Ahmed. I don't think that it is possible now. Uh, Armenian mood, uh, Armenian view, Armenian, I mean, official Yerevan view on that is out of corridors logic. It's about yes. opening borders and normalize relationships in this problem with Azerbaijan and Turkey. 
and not to discuss with Azerbaijanis, are they going to withdraw uh, Russian border guards from Armenian territory, or are we going to withdraw, uh, let's say, I don't know, Turkish uh, uh, monitoring group from Azerbaijani territory? It's a domestic problem of Azerbaijan and Armenia. It's uh, the Armenian mood is opening roads, normalize opening all communications between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Turkey. Uh, in that, it's about conflict resolution, by the way. For conflict resolution, you don't need Danzig corridors or Kaliningrad corridors. You need open communications when Armenian driver or a person will be able to go through Azerbaijan to God knows, to Iran or Russia or uh, whatever. And Azerbaijani citizen or driver or whoever would be able, or goods with goods, would be able to go through uh, Armenia to uh, to Turkey uh, with, or to Nakhichevan without um, corridor logic. Azerbaijan, I wouldn't say that Azerbaijanis agree on that composition. It's not the same. The the uh, I would say that the, this printed plan of Mr. Pashinyan to open all roads, Armenia as a crossroads, etc., and opening of uh, Zagazur corridor is not the same. They are quite different types of. Uh, of resolution of the problem of communication in South Caucasus. Uh, I wouldn't say that Zangezur Corridor for Azerbaijan is is, uh, is about economy or communications. It's political project to yes. push on Armenia for, uh, for official Baku is not just an instrument for something. It's a goal. Continue yeah, pushing on Armenia now from uh, occupied territories, exclaves, I, I don't know, corridors, etc. All these are not just instruments, hate speech, uh, all these things, uh, you know. Uh, it is, it is a, a goal both in domestic policy and in uh, foreign policy of Azerbaijan. So I don't think that it is possible at the moment and I, I'm afraid that the pressure will be continue. Just uh, today, they killed a soldier at the border. Just today, this day, mm -hmm. and this is continuing from time to time. You have escalations. You have speech, hate speech. You have narratives uh, from Azerbaijan, and you have these types of diplomatic pressure, or how the narratives pressure. Uh, on corridors and such kind of things. But I don't think, uh, and finish with that, I don't think that it is really, in that I agree with Ahmed, that I don't think that it is possible uh, now. Okay, okay, thank you. Finally, okay, I want to pick up the question. It's a question of Narek uh, Sefarian. Uh, what, if, what do you know about uh, to Ahmad and to Arzu? Uh, what do you know about the issue of Western Azerbaijan, the issue which, uh, and can you explain what does it mean? This issue was uh, uh, articulated was uh, by Ilham Aliyev. He even created this community of, uh, maybe everyone, everyone ca can, uh, say, can say a few words about Western Azerbaijan. He even had this Congress of people from Western Azerbaijan. I would like to start with Arzu, uh, Ahmad, and then uh, maybe everyone can also come uh, comment on this. What is Western Azerbaijan, please? I would actually defer to um, Ahmed's expertise on this because I feel like he will um, have uh, a lot more to say on this topic. And yeah. Oh, thank you. Like that, uh, I believe that you also could share your opinion. That would be interesting for me to hear also that. But uh, if you want my opinion on the issue, uh, it generated as Azerbaijan mirroring Armenian rhetoric on 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 Karabakh. So if there is uh, claims to the sovereign territory of other body, so and there is uh, some connection with the history, why Azerbaijan cannot find very similar case? From the history and the, the mirror that and that was a 
political pressure tool to show that uh, if the can if the narratives on Karabakh will continue, so Azerbaijan will be insisted on on uh, Western Azerbaijan. So it's very similar, like the human rights of Karabakh Armenians, human rights of the Azerbaijanis once lived in um, in uh, modern day Armenia. Uh, and it's not only about the 1988, uh, like the Azerbaijanis who were out from Armenia in 1988, but also there is a, a well well known in Azerbaijan, but quite less known in abroad that in 1948, 1951, there were Soviet Union decree uh, to uh, evacuate quite a large number of the Azerbaijanis. Uh, from the modern day Armenian territory to the modern day Azerbaijan territory, so from Soviet Armenia to Soviet Azerbaijan, because to accommodate the uh, uh, Armenians coming to Armenia from abroad, the repatriation. So that was the 1948-1951 yeah. events taking place. So that was yeah. mirroring that, but will it develop into something bigger, some bigger national narrative? I hope that the peace deal will be signed soon, and as a result, there will be this the the charges against each other will be dropped off, and as a result, we are not going to see the continuation of that. So the peace deal should solve all of these issues. So it generated as a political uh, message to Armenia that any claims on on Karabakh will have a reaction from Azerbaijan. Will be counterbalanced. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, is Gerard? Do you want to say anything? For, anything about uh, Western Azerbaijan? Well, I guess I, I want to ask Ahmed on this. Um, so, from an outside perspective, uh, the Aliyev uh, government has used the idea of Karabakh and reclaiming Karabakh as part of its legitimacy for for years and then began to uh, deliver on that with the spectacle you know astounding to me in the 44 day war of live images uh, on billboards in baku of uh, tanks being destroyed and people being killed in in karabakh um so i the question i have given what you had said about increased expectations the emotional surge and the like, uh, you know, is this enough? Is it enough? Do you think that the uh, government can turn this off or is it addicted to this sort of a certain territorial fetishism as always getting the next thing? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd welcome your, your thoughts on that. Well, I, I have heard so many, so very um, um, grateful for the questions. And I have heard so many variations of that question, frankly speaking. So I, I can list the whole the variation in various topics. I even remember that one of the diplomats asked me uh, that what's in uh, President Aliyev's mind, Karabakh or something bigger? So that was the, uh, the, the question back then. So there's so many variations of that. Uh, let me put it this way. That and that I believe that once we discuss this issue exactly, Hill and Mikhail, I believe that he he might remember that. Uh, now with this middle corridor project in the line, and the, the, with a wider geopolitical confrontation with Russia and with Iran, like that, and uh, Azerbaijan has a we are located in the standard region, frankly speaking. So there is a much bigger issues like the in the front for Azerbaijan. So that is why like the, the, the focusing on Armenia, I don't think that that's the, going to mean the, the first issue on, on the uh, foreign policy uh, of Azerbaijan. Karabakh was everything for Azerbaijan foreign policy, yeah. economically, diplomatically. For the last 30 years, the country devoted all of its resources to this direction. But right now, it's kind of there's a feeling that it wants to draw out from that. And the, frankly speaking, like in these days in, 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 in Azerbaijan, there are a lot of talk about the middle corridor, how to be this bridge between Turkey, Europe, and Central Asia, China. So that gives a much more, um, uh, like let's say, geopolitical satisfaction that being part of the much bigger geopolitical project 
than any other. I would say that, like the, for example, the, the satisfaction, the public satisfaction in 2020 and the public satisfaction in 2023, it's a couple different. So there is a appetite, it, it, it grown to much bigger geopolitical projects than um, focusing on Armenia. So that's why I don't expect um, that Armenia is going to be the you know, the um, first point in Azerbaijan foreign policy agenda. Again, for the last 30 years, uh, Azerbaijan devoted everything to this project. Everything, like economically, culturally, uh, socially, everything. Now there is a change happening, and I believe that there is a, um, there are quite a, quite many people that are asking the questions that, uh, what's next? So now the country is, generating a new target for imposed target for itself and the the middle um, the corridor and the, by middle corridor i mean that the political economic social cultural contacts of the central asia south caucasus turkey and azerbaijan sees its role as the unique role the so that is much more attractive than anything against armenia in the future i hope i could answer that question yeah thank you Okay, anyone else who wants to comment on uh, uh, Western Azerbaijan, uh, uh, Western Azerbaijan term? I just wanted to say that uh, about Zangizur corridor, that the, the word corridor itself is not right, because why don't call it just road because of these powers? And second, I wanted to say that uh, just uh, because my, my opinion is uh, Oh, completely different than uh, than um, at least, and I wanted to say that uh, the thing is that the central principle of uh, Azerbaijan all these years was territorial integrity, and now it is contradicting itself. and And my answer would be that as Putin, he needs constant war to stay uh, in power forever. That's it. Thank you. Yes, very yes. yes. Uh, and he wants I... to play. And he wants to play decisive role everywhere when where there is any political. If there is something going on. He wants to play a role. Uh, do he wants to do something? And uh, now uh, we talked about Zangizur corridor. We talked about uh, what is uh, what role the United States should play in this conflict. Uh, can anyone uh, elaborate on this issue? Can I try? Yes, please. You want to comment on Zangizur? A couple or... of words about Zangizur Corridor. Is it about Western no, no. Azerbaijan? No. Western Azerbaijan, please. Western Azerbaijan. First, uh, uh, partly I would agree, uh, partly but fully I would agree with Ahmed, but partly not. Where I'm not agree that uh, this is, uh, he said that. Uh, it's an answer to uh, Armenian discourses on uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh. No, I wouldn't say so because uh, Western Azerbaijan is uh, now this uh, Azerbaijani narrative for Armenia itself, whole Armenia, all Armenia. It's not about part of that. They call Western Azerbaijan Republic of Armenia with all its territory. Yeah. So it's different. Uh, why uh, next uh, next thesis I would agree with him. He said that this is an answer. So uh, it is really it looks like I'll do this. I'm strong. So if you talk about Karabakh, I will bring this Western Azerbaijan uh, agenda on the table. If it will be continuing, I will shoot because I'm stronger than you now. This is part of politics. I would repeat that uh, that uh, they do it because they can, because they have this opportunity, because uh, uh, because because result of of the war of 2020. As for United States of America, uh, United States of America, Europe. Uh, West in general, they try to do what they can do uh, using political instruments, proposing to uh, sides of the conflict a place 
technical assistance, if needed, financial assistance, I don't know, place for negotiation, help in negotiations, etc. This is not enough. It is absolutely clear for everybody in Baku because not Washington, not European Union, not I don't know who, would send their, I don't know, rangers to guarantee physical security of people in Republic of Armenia and at the border. Not talking about Nagorno-Karabakh itself and people who left Nagorno-Karabakh forcibly and they are now in Armenia. Nobody is going to do, do that. They do it, they try to help. They really try to uh, organize kind of consolidating position on this problem. They do what they can, but in Azerbaijan, they understand very good. In, in but By the way, in Baku and in Ankara as well, they understand very good that uh, you, you really cannot do something real on the ground and political instruments are not enough. So we will see continuation of Western and American uh, in particular <laughs> work on that. Oh, with hopes that someday it will bring to some results, but at the moment I cannot, uh, I cannot see it. Azerbaijan already occupied approximately 160 uh, square kilometers of Armenian, Armenian, I mean, Republic of Armenia Armen. territory, hills at the, at the border. And they are building their military objects, etc. And, and what? And nothing. You have, uh, from war of 2020, you have uh, soldiers, you have people who are in Baku till the moment. Uh, etc. So, uh, in in this case, to help just with diplomatic activity uh, is not enough. Stop here. Okay, we have just two minutes left. Okay, uh, I guess uh, that's about it. Um, all of um, I think we should stop over here. I want to thank all participants of this roundtable. I hope I will see everyone and thank you everyone for your questions. Sorry, I didn't have, we didn't have time to answer all questions. I hope I will see everyone. Uh, at least I hope I will see everybody in the future, in the nearest future. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for taking part in this discussion and uh, have a great day. Thank you.